welcome to this third, this is the third online workshop from the Social Data in the Third Sector series, looking at skills, tools and evidence. Um, my name is Patty Doran and I work for the UK Data Service. I'll turn on my webcam so you can see me. Hello. It's nice to see you. Um, well, it's nice to know you're there at least. <laughs> um, and so today in this third workshop, we're going to talk about telling a story with data. And just to give you an overview of what we're covering, um, I'm going to give a quick introduction. Uh, then I'm going to give a sort of a slideshow presentation looking at telling a story with data. We're going to have a quick quiz just to test that um, how you um, understood the presentation. And then I'm going to give a demonstration of how we find and explore data using the UK Data Service website and tools. Then I'm going to give you an activity to do in your own time which will take about 10 or hopefully 15 minutes you'll have for that. And then we'll have some feedback from the activity and finish with discussion and questions. So just um, quickly to give an overview, uh, the research, uh, the UK Data Service is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and it's a single point of access for a wide range of secondary data. But as well as accessing the data, we also run support services. Um, we have online training. We have training guides and videos all online. Um, so there's a lot of support available. And I work for the user support and training team that delivers that support and training. This workshop objective is all about uh, trying to promote our resources to third sector users. So we want to increase understanding um, within the sector of how data can be used um, within a variety of ways and to support your services. And we want to support you to access that data and be able to use it. And I think by doing that, uh, we'll be able to help um, you produce the evidence and enhance um, the service that you provide. So specifically, um, we're looking, I think it's a good match using our data with the third sector because uh, lots of the organisations in the charity or voluntary sector are working to, with groups whose social data is collected about. So you might be working to improve outcomes for marginalised groups or reducing inequalities um, and providing a range of support to those most in need. And well aware that the funding for lots of the services, lots of the charity sector relies on continual funding and to get the funding you need to demonstrate your impact and providing quali uh, qualitative data to support your work um, can help do that. And so the data that we hold at the UK Data Service can help provide the context and demonstrate um, where services are most needed. And just to reiterate, um, I know some of you have heard this before, but um, we know that within the third sector there's a whole range of organisations, so it's quite hard to sort of provide training uh, that's specific to you. So hopefully you'll get an overview today of what's available and we'll be able to follow up with some of the um, resources that we have to help your work further. So just to say that in the UK Data Service we hold different sorts of data. We have aggregate data, um, like particularly the census data that we covered in the first workshop, micro data from surveys um, and other sources, and we also have qualitative data. But today we're looking at micro data specifically the UK surveys. So we're going to talk about um, how you can tell a story with data. So why use social survey data first? So it's very large data sets and the findings from any analysis, uh, if you use the big robust data sets, are generalizable to the population. So it provides quantifiable evidence to help explain social problems and it provides context and justifies the need for services. And um, I just wanted to point out as well that it can be used alongside other evidence from project delivery. And I'm going to give two examples now of how social survey data has been used sort of in these ways. So first of all, this is me from another life, it feels like, um, before I thought that going into research was a good career move. Um, so I used to work for Manchester City Council and I was funded for many years, several years, by Macmillan Cancer Support to develop and run an information support service through Manchester Libraries. So I am um, Macmillan funded me to do my Masters and I wanted to investigate the influence of emotional support on the quality of life of older cancer survivors. And so the focus of my thesis 
kind of um, developed on some a campaign that Macmillan was running at the time called the Age Old Excuse, and they were exploring this trend that was seen sort of in the health data of the under-treatment of older cancer patients. So that what that graph is sort of um, demonstrating is that there's kind of, across the different cancer types, there's a similar level of treatment, and then treatment begins to drop off at the age of 60 for some cancers and more significantly around 70 to 79 for other cancers. And by the time you get to 80, you know, your chances of getting certain treatments um, are, are quite low compared to those in the younger age groups. And of course, there's many reasons for that, but one of my theories was that having support network around you and people to, to advocate for you perhaps would influence how much treatment you got. And so I use data from the National Cancer Patient Experience Survey, which is held by the UK Data Service. This is just a screenshot of the um, catalogue record that we have. And so the Cancer Patient Experience Survey, as you'd kind of um, take from the name, is uh, it questions people, it surveys people about their experience of uh, going through the system and having cancer treatment. And in it, there's questions about um, what treatment they received. And you can see, um, hopefully on the side here, this is the number of cases. So there were 71,000, nearly 72,000 people interviewed in the survey. So it was a very um, large data set. And what I looked at is how, many, how much treatment um, different people had. And I, I looked across all cancer types. And so it was a bit of a crude measure, but I was looking at um, how much treatment people had. So whether they had no treatment, one treatment, two treatments, or three treatments. So that could be one treatment of chemotherapy and a treatment of radiotherapy or surgery or you know two rounds of chemotherapy or whatever it was. And so I just compared whether people had no treatment to, to three in, and just looked at the trends. Um, the first graph, the one on the left, uh, is just the count. So you can see that most people received um, either two treatments or one treatment and uh, much fewer people received um, no treatment or three treatments. It's less common for, for those occurrences. So, for example, it would be very common for people to have surgery followed by chemotherapy or surgery followed by radiotherapy. Um, but to look at it more clearly, to look at any sort of inequality across age, I changed it to a percentage. So I was looking at out of all the people um, who only received no treatment or three treatments or one or two, what percentage was in each age bracket. Or, and it wasn't actually an age bracket, it was at each specific age. So that's how I got the continuous variable and the trend that goes across. And when you look at the percentage and you're looking at all the different um, the categories with different numbers of treatment, you can very clearly see that um, no treatment was much more common in the older age groups and it was much less, less common in the younger age groups. And in fact, the trend was reduced to so this blue line is the three treatments, two treatments, one treatment, no. And it's the opposite order in the older age. So that was um, my findings which supported the uh, research that Macmillan was doing or the campaign that Macmillan was running about age and age inequalities um, with treatment. So that's one example. Um, the next example I'm taking from a blog post that I mentioned last week. So this is some work that was being promoted by Morgan Vine from um, National, it was on the National Voices blog page, and she works for Independent Age. And I'd put out a report looking at older people and looking at their experiences, um, and particularly looking at uh, sort of minority groups across older people to see what their experiences were and how they differed. And in this piece of work that they did, it was actually used a mixed methods approach. So first of all, they did a scoping review, so they kind of collected information from literature about what they already knew about the topic. And then they conducted in-depth qualitative interviews with, the, I think there were about 45 older people. And then they carried out some analysis of quantitative survey data. And they used Understanding Society, which is one of our key data sets. 
it's actually a longitudinal study, so it follows the same households across time. But it can also be used to, for a snapshot of the population to find out what their experiences are. And I quite like the way that they presented their findings. So um, this is just sort of one section of it. They had uh, about six or eight different groups of older people. But here we can see people with physical health conditions and people with mental health conditions. And they had on the left what they found from their scoping review, what they knew from the literature, the problems that were evident. And then they had like quotes from the people they interviewed and what they were highlighting as issues. And they put that alongside some of the statistics that they're drawn out from the Understanding Society uh, research from the, from the study. So they were adding the quantitative findings to their quality of research and what they generally knew from the literature to add a bit more robustness to um, the report that they were producing. So that was one way of using the um, quantitative data to tell a story about the problem that they knew already existed um, and they had done further research into through their interviews. So they just used the data to sort of back up what they already knew. And by adding these nice graphs and figures, it kind of um, quantifies the problem a bit more and makes it a lot more tangible. Yeah. And I just wanted to point out at this point as well that we have a, a blog, a data impact blog at the UK Data Service. And here you'll find other examples of how people have used um, data to tell stories and data to you know, address a problem that they see. Um, and I'd encourage you to have a look. And I'd also encourage you, if you are using any of our data, to get in touch if you'd like to um, write about it and write what you found. And we can support you to do that if you'd like, but um, we're always interested in knowing how people use our data and what stories they are telling. So I just wanted to signpost you there as well. Um, second half of this presentation, I just wanted to talk about how you go about finding data to tell your story. So there's different ways of finding data on the UK Data Service website. Um, you can use the data catalogue which you'll find on the um, main homepage of our site. You can search for data sets um, and when you put the search term in, it will search either for a word in the data set title or for keywords or from the abstract. But, so it will be broad connections to the topic. You can also search, if you click on um, Get Data, which is one of the tabs at the top, it will bring you to this page. And from there, you can click to Key Data or Data by Theme. And you can use those ways to start to look at what sort of survey data might be available for your, for your needs. Um, to reiterate, we hold a lot of data. I think there's something like 7,000 data sets. So it's, it can be a bit of a process to find the data um, and to know which data is going to provide um, a robust uh, sort of example for your needs. And so the key data we have is all data that you know um, will be generalizable to the wider population. We hold data um, from the big government surveys, from big research centers, but we also hold data from individual research projects. Um, if you had data that you wanted to securely store, you could store your data with us so we're a safe repository for any social data um, or even some data that's not specifically social survey data. And so not all our data is going to be um, the same size and quality as each other. It's up to the individual depositors to deposit with us what they see fit. So by going to our key data sets, you know that you're looking at data that is of a certain standard. It's, it's um, about the whole of the UK generally, if you're looking at the UK survey data, and it will be generalizable to the population as a whole. So going to the key data is a good way to find data that you know you can rely on for that sort of evidence. Um, and the same is with the data by theme, but it's just 
categorized in different ways, so it's got different topics that you can start to narrow down where you're looking for for your data sets. And then somewhere else where I'd suggest that you look for data, which I touched on last week, is the variable and question bank. And we're going to explore that a bit more um, in our activity in a bit. Uh, the other way to look for data is to open it up and just have a look at the data and see if you think it's telling you what, what you'd like to see. So one way of doing that is to explore via Nestar, which is an online tool we have where lots of our data sets are loaded into. Um, we did a bit of exploring of that last week in workshop two, and we'll have a very brief look at that again today. So um, I'd encourage you to use that to look at the data. But um, some advice that I was given not long after I started at the UK Data Service was just to open it up and have a look. So there's nothing stopping you um, downloading full data sets from the UK Data Service when you're just exploring and you're just trying to get an idea of what's out there. I used to sort of think that every time I downloaded data, I sort of had to be using it because it was such a, um, you know, it's kind of a, a safeguarded resource and I kind of thought I'm only going to download it if I really need it. Um, part of that was because when you opened it, it sometimes seems so big and overwhelming as well. I kind of didn't want to go there unless I sort of needed to. But I was encouraged to do it more, and now I do. So downloading data sets is something that I do on a daily basis just to have a look. Um, I mean, that is sort of my job as well, so that's a bit of a, um, a given, I guess. But I do encourage you to download data sets and have a look. So there's a screenshot here from R where I've just opened up um, the crime survey for England and Wales. This is just the teaching open access data set that you see here. But once you have the full data set open, you can kind of search through it for questions that you liked and automatically start to do some descriptive um, statistics just to see what's available. Um, you can do some of that in Nestar as well, but if you have the whole data set open, some ways you're going straight to the questions that you're looking for and it's a one way of exploring and finding the data that you want. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on a couple of other things, other points that I made last week, just to reiterate that it's really important to make sense of your data, that you look at the documentation. So you need to know what information was collected, where it came from, when and where it was collected, how the data has been changed before it's been archived. And we have the whole set of user guides, questionnaires and interview schedules attached to every data set. So you can look at those in order to help make sense of your data before you do, um, yeah, sort of delve too far into it. And also, as I said last week, it's um, not a linear process always when you're trying to find data. It's, it's iterative. You have to go back and forth. So you might have your problem that you're trying to address and you might get open up some data that you think will be perfect and you find it doesn't actually have all the questions you want. So you kind of go back and go forth and you explore different data sets in different ways. So you need to set aside some time to explore different data sets, explore different questions, explore different ways of finding the right uh, survey data to answer your questions. So that's where we're going to leave the presentation for now. So I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions um, just to check that that all made sense. So there'll be a couple more polls that come up on your screen. And if you just answer those for me, um, we'll see how we go. So the first one, um, what's, a, what's one of the reasons why you might use quantitative social data? Um, and most of you said, um, as I was trying to emphasize, um, because it helps provide context. But, you know, everyone does like statistics as well. That's a very um, genuine point to make as well. I kind of was just being a bit cheeky when I put that in there. But uh, I think particularly funders, like some funders like statistics or like some um, statistics. And no one's selected because the government funders spend lots of money collecting it, which um, it's, it's true, but um, it's not really the main reason to do it. It's because it does provide such excellent um, context to what we're doing. So that's great. We'll move on to the next question. Using the UK Data Service website, there are several ways to find data. 
true or false? That's right, it's uh, true. There's lots of different ways to find data. Um, yeah, and uh, in some ways it's a bit unfortunate. It's not in, like the diagram I showed before. It's not a linear process to go through our website and find the data that you're looking for. You might want to try different ways, um, and eventually it will all sort of build up into a um, direct path, perhaps, and you'll find the data that you're looking for. So I think, is there one more question now? Yeah, so finding the right data is a linear process, an iterative process, and or all about luck. Again, these questions aren't really about right and wrong answers. It's just mainly to make you sort of think about the process. So um, I generally would say it's an iterative process. Um, I mean, it could be seen as a linear process, but it goes back and forth and around, but eventually you get the straight line. Um, or it could be all about luck sometimes if you find the right data. So, um, yeah, so it, it's just to emphasize that it is a process. So now I'm going to um, show you a little demonstration of the website and how we might go about um, finding data. I'm just going to turn off my webcam so that it gives you a bit more space. Please do say, um, I should have mentioned earlier, in fact, someone got a question already. Um, we do have a, a question box if you have any questions as you go along. Um, I will answer them at the end of the discussion, but feel free to put them down as you think about them. So the question box is in the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, there is also the option to raise your hand. I've got someone with their hand up. Um, if perhaps you want to write your question in the question box, and either myself or Ali might introduce, uh, answer the question as we go along. So just please do use that question box and we'll return to that at the end. Um, but for now, um, we're going to have a look at the website. So hopefully, um, I'll just double check that you can see my screen. I think you can. So this is the UK Data Service website. Um, and as I mentioned, on the home page, there is a, um, a search bar. And so that's to search the, the data catalog. So um, as an example, we can imagine that we were interested in computer use. Um, we're interested in how many households perhaps have access to computers or are able to use computers. And we want to provide some context um, in that. So we want to find out about computer usage. So we put computer usage into our data catalog and see what comes up. So as I mentioned with the data catalog, it's searching um, survey titles. It will also be searching keywords and it will also be searching abstracts. Um, so you can see the first things that come up are things that have computers in the title, but um, perhaps it's not so helpful to find out about the computer survey from 1970. Um, that's not exactly what we're after. So we might refine the dates here on the left-hand side and say we're interested in things that are more from, at least maybe should we say, the um, last 10 years, so since 2010, and we'll refine that date. And so then we've got different things coming up, some things that look a bit sort of um, interesting. So it's not many at all really that are coming up. Now, now I've only got five results, so maybe something isn't quite right about what I'm searching and it's um, not quite what I'm after. So I'm going to go a bit older. But um, some of this, the well, data catalogue should have quite a lot around computer usage, you would have thought. So I'm kind of thinking something I'm doing is going wrong. Um, so the things that you can do to help focus your your uh, searching is use these things on the side. Because some of these studies, I would say, are qualitative studies because we're searching the whole catalogue, which includes qualitative as well as quantitative studies. And perhaps we've been a bit too specific in our search terms. But first of all, I want to take out any qualitative studies. In fact, I'm just interested in UK survey data. And you can see there's only one there. And this is perceptions of electricity use at home and in the workplace. And that's um, from Nottingham University. So that's not one of our big key data sets. That's um, 
a single study that's been completed by someone from Nottingham University. So that's that's a bit unusual. So you kind of think, well, I'm not getting to where I want to with the data catalogue. And that could in part be because um, it's only searching the titles and not many titles are going to have, or abstracts or keywords are going to have things in them about computer usage. So I'm going to try a different route. So I'm going to go up here to get data and see what I can find. So from get data, you can still browse the catalog, but I'm going to um, have a look at the key data sets and see um, what I can find in terms of things that I think might, servers that I think might hold the information I'm looking for. And so I start to scroll down the list and, um, or maybe community life survey, maybe, maybe not. Um, family expenditure survey, maybe, not quite sure. General lifestyle survey, that might be good. I might click on that and explore that one. But you can see there's quite a long list of surveys um, that we call our key surveys. So these are all surveys that we know, um, it tells you up the top here, um, uh, all surveys that can be used to inform policy and that they can, so from the analysis of it, you could compare populations from one point of time. So there's lots of surveys there. So that's kind of just um, mind boggling a bit, blowing my mind. So it's, it's not helping me focus this down. So I'm gonna look at the themes. And so from the themes, we've got um, big themes that they group the key data sets by. And so if I scroll down here, there's a theme for information and communication. And that might be where I'm, I find more information. So I'm going to have a look down there. And so this is all the key data that we've got about information that tells us about information and communication. And you've got the British Cohort Study, which is a big longitudinal study. The British Social Attitude Survey. Oh, and that sounds like it might be interesting. And you can see this table here is uh, refined by study name, the coverage, and the topics. And here the topic, it actually says internet usage. And I'm like, oh, well, that's probably where I was going wrong. You know, I still think of computers and internet sort of interchangeably when perhaps that was the problem. I should have been looking for internet usage as opposed to computer usage, depending on my my topic, you know, um, or my thinking, you know, am I really interested in how many people have computers in their homes, or is that less relevant now that um, people have access to the internet using their phones? Um, my sister likes to tell me that um, your phone is a computer. It's certainly more powerful than the Amiga that we had um, in our family home as a child. So thinking, all oh, right, so this is what I'm looking for now. I'm looking for internet. So this is helping me focus my um, my direction, it's helping me focus on what I want to look for. This one does have computer usage, which is interesting, that's growing up in Scotland. That's a longitudinal study following children who grow up, so um, in television viewing. Lots of these studies are now bringing in things like tablet use and just any sort of device time as well. So, but I think it's important to note that you have to be quite careful about your use of terms and the terminology that you use. So um, bearing that in mind, I'm going to go back um, to this Get Data tab at the top, and I'm going to look at um, uh, this box here, which is the Variable and Question Bank. So this has a whole repository of survey questions. And so it asks us, um, so we can search in here for any questions about internet use, I shall put, and see what comes up. And so now we're looking um, for exact, uh, yeah, exact um, questions around internet use. And you can see that also we've got questions here saying secondary activity, this isn't making a lot of sense to me right at the moment, thinking, so if we maybe view the responses and it tells us, oh, I see, so it's telling us this is the time you survey and it's telling you how you use your time. And so internet must be one of the uses of people's times. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's making a bit more sense. So you might be able to find something from the time you survey. Um, and but there's a lot here and they all seem to be the same. They all seem to be from the time you survey, time you survey, 
So is there a different way of looking at this? And so you could look at it from a series point of view. So because every time the question is asked in the time use survey, it will come up as a different result uh, for, from the variable and question bank. And it's the same with the catalog. So you can either look at it per individual survey or you can look at it um, for the whole series of that survey. So I'm going to click on this first one and see what happens. The Opinion and Lifestyle Survey and refine that. And now we're getting into questions that I'm a bit more interested in. Do you not use the internet? Um, reasons um, given for not using the internet. Um, and so we can have a look at some of these and see what the answers are. And so you can see that poor internet poor opinion of the internet. Um, that's all missing from that one, so that's quite interesting. But it's still giving you an example of a survey where, which asks a question about the, about the internet, about the topic that you're interested in. So this is a good way to begin to find out what sort of questions are asked and where you might find them, where you might find the answers. And you can continue to um, refine your results by using the different boxes on, on the right. So I'm going to change this one to internet usage and see if that comes up. So reasons to get broadband and again why did you upgrade to broadband? Um, so different answers are coming up. So you have to keep trying and seeing uh, different ways that questions are asked and different um, surveys that ask the questions and eventually you'll find something that you're looking for but it can be a bit of a investigative process. So this one is taking me to the Omnibus survey from 2005 and so I might view that catalogue record and see what happens. So this is telling me about the Omnibus survey and you think well I didn't even see that in the key data. I don't know what this omnibus survey is. Um, so you scroll down, you have a look at the catalogue and you see what you can find. Um, down here is the abstract and, you, and it tells you that the opinions and lifestyle survey, formerly known as the omnibus or the um, ONS opinion survey. And so now things are beginning to link together because I think we saw earlier under themes that opinions and lifestyle survey was one of the ones that asked questions about um, information and communication. So we're beginning to get warmer we think, things are linking together. So I'm just going to go back to that page that came from the variable and question bank um, because this uh, can be, this is quite an interesting point to move from. And so I'm going to look now to see what happens when I view uh, response percentages. I'm just going to open that in a new tab by right clicking on that so I can come back to this page and if I want to search the variable and question bank again. I'm going to go up to this page. Oh, internal server error. That's no good. <laughs> um, that was taking me to Nestar though. Um, we can see up here I was in Nestar. So normally that would link right through to Nesta. I hope it's not down because we're going to all use it um, in, in a bit. So I'm going to pick an um, earlier survey and see um, if I can get through to Nesta. So I'm going to look at dates here and I want just to look for one. It might be that that data set was actually too old to look into Nesta. So actually, yeah, 2010, we'll try and refine that. Um, and so, this is, so now we're up to the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey and we can see that they actually had an internet access module in 2014. So that's interesting. Um, we can explore that and we find out lots of information potentially about um, internet use. So that's more like what we're after. This box here, you can see expand to view the responses. And so we've got the question, how did you pay for the goods or services you ordered over the internet in the last 12 months? And straight away by dropping down this box, you can actually see the, the answers to that question. 
So it's interesting to know what the answer options were, but also what the actual responses were. So provided by credit or debit card over the internet, prepaid account. Um, so you're like, well, that is quite interesting. Maybe I will look into this one a bit more. And you've got the answers there, but again, it'd be much more helpful to look at that as a percentage of, um, we can't even quite see here how many people were in the survey. So these exact numbers aren't giving us really the detail that we want. So I'm going to try again to look at the percentages. And here we go. This is more what we're after. So now we're in Nestar, it's, and it's linked us straight through to that survey, uh, the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey in Nestar. So this is an online tool to explore the survey data. And you can see we're, we've gone straight through to this question, how do you pay for the goods and services you ordered? And now we've got it in a little bit of a, um, we've got the numbers still, but we've also got it graphically in a little graph, and we've got the percentages so that we know that most people who pay for goods and services over the internet pay for them with a credit or debit card. That's 85%. So that's most of them. But what I think is quite helpful about linking through to Nestar in this way is that it shows you um, all the other questions that were asked around the same things in the survey. So you can see we've linked through here to the internet um, access module questions. So now all of a sudden we have all the questions that were asked around internet access. So you can scroll um, up and down this and say, do you have access to the internet at home? Well, that was one of the things I was interested in. So we've got yes um, for 83.6%. Um, and you can see now the number of cases as well. It was 3,000 cases. So now we're finally beginning to understand um, or find the answers to some of the questions that we were after. You can see this is from 2014, this data. But we know that um, the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey is repeated um, frequently, so we'll be able to find most more up-to-date data as well if we want to. And we've got all here, all the different reasons that um, people might not have internet at the home. When did you last use the internet? That might be interesting. Um, most people are saying within the last three months. But you've still got 10% of people saying they've never used it, which is quite a you know, reasonable proportion. Um, your household has internet, but you have never used it. Is that right? So we've got all sorts of questions here. So you can scroll through just to find the sort of questions that are being asked and the sort of replies. The reason that questions might be repeated like this is in this survey they've broken it up so that each response or each variable here is only one answer, it's one category of the question. So this is response one. It's, so you'd have to look into the documentation, like I was saying earlier, in order to fully understand what some of these questions are asking and to make sure that you're understanding the context of how the question was asked correctly. So that is um, the way you'd go about exploring. Um, the data using Nestar. Um, oh, and I didn't open in a new tab here, so I can't go straight back to the UK Data Service website without um, scrolling through all the tabs that I've um, clicked through, which is why I suggested earlier that you open it up in a new tab. But just a reminder, so we got here from uh, the variable and question bank, searching the internet, and we got to the variable and question bank from Get Data. So that was how we linked through that process and explored for that question. Um, and the only other thing I was briefly going to show you was the other way, if we went back then to the uh, UK Data Service website and then we decided that we were interested in the um, opinions and lifestyle survey um, because that had all those questions that we wanted. Um, this is what I was saying earlier about lots, of, every instance of the survey comes up when you do a catalogue search um, and it's not necessarily in chronological order, it might be which surveys are used more often. So the easy way to go to it is to click on this tab here which is series and because the Opinions and Lifestyle Survey is one of our key data sets, it has its own series 
where all those surveys are linked together. So we can click on the opinions and lifestyle surveys here. It gives you an abstract and you can access the data there. And then from here, um, this is the most recent ones, that's older ones, are the two, 1990 to 2007. And so that's secure access, these ones. So this middle one's the one we're after, if we're after more recent data. And so you can drop down from here and see all the different surveys that we can either explore online with Nestar or we could log in and download the full data set and explore it with our own um, computer. Um, and I've just opened up a data set in R. Um, again, this is the crime survey for England and Wales. But you can open up the data in a um, software package um, and then explore it online and start to pull together any sort of um, descriptive variables that you're particularly interested in. So you can find out the responses to different uh, questions and perhaps start to do some cross tabs and work out how they relate to other questions and start to just really investigate whether or not that survey is a survey that is going to answer the questions that you're looking for. So those are all different ways that you can go about exploring survey data in um, using the UK Data Service. And so now we're going to do an activity and you're going to have a go of doing some of those, uh, exploring some of those ways of finding data. Um, if this morning you were emailed the handout for this, uh, for this um, activity, but it should look like this. Um, and if you didn't have it on email yet, it is available in the GoToWebinar control panel under Handouts. It's a PDF handout. Um, and uh, if you have trouble using the um, UK Day Service website and following the instructions in the handout, I suggest you use um, Alt-Tab or um, Command-Tab if you're on a Mac to flip through screens. It's quite an easy way of going back and forth. There's several questions um, throughout the worksheet and if you just jot down the answers to those, we'll do some polls at the end. So if you follow the instructions on that handout, um, you can post any questions or if you need any help in the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll do our best to answer them and to help you through it. But just work through the exercise in your own time and we'll, as I said, we'll answer some questions at the end and we'll come back together, um, what's the time now? We'll come back together at uh, 3 o'clock to um, answer, answer those questions. So work through the handout, put any questions in the question box and we'll come back together at 3 p.m. to discuss the answers. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so it's 3 o'clock, so we might come back together now and kind of have a discussion about how you got on with those with that activity. Hopefully um, you got through it. So um, if you're all able to come back to the main screen, um, I'm going to ask first a few questions to see how you got on. So firstly, um, did you manage to complete the activity or at least get most of the way through it? Looking like most of you did. Um, that's good. Um, all these worksheets will be put up with the, uh, the recording of the workshop um, in a couple of days. So if you want to go back to it or if um, you, know, you want to suggest it to a colleague or something, the PDF will be there with the um, workshop or work yeah, the workshop uh, recording on our system. So that's great, thank you. Um, so the first question that you came across in the activity, so how many respondents from the British Social Attitude Survey 2016 um, replied um, to the variable CC believe with the answer, um, I don't believe that climate change is taking place So this is the answer that you could have got from um, just from looking in the 
a variable and question bank and dropping down um, the cross there and where it doesn't have the percentages but it does tell you the absolute numbers of people that responded to different questions. Um, and I think most of you have got it there, it was 150. So um, it looks, this is the sort of screenshot which you should have come across when you dropped down this part here. Um, so 314 was, I believe, that climate change is taking place, but not as a result of humans. Um, and it was 150 that said, I don't believe that climate change is taking place at all. So if we go to the second question, so now we wanted to know what the percentage was. So that meant clicking on the question and drilling down a bit more and linking through to Nestar. So hopefully Nestar worked for you all. So what percentage of um, respondents was that, that 150? What percentage was that of the total people that filled in the survey? Um, it looks like everybody's pretty much getting this one right. So that's great. So that was the 5.1%. So again, from the um, from the Nestar page, you could see the percentages. But you could also see, oh, I didn't put it in the screenshot, but you could also see the total number of respondents. So it was around um, 3,000 respondents. So that 150 represented 5.1%. Um, so we'll go to the next question, which was, what do people think about climate change? So this was the whole question that we were trying to explore with the activity. What attitudes potentially need to change? So to answer this question, I was just really looking for you to explore the other questions um, in Nestar, um, having a bit of a look to see what else people were asked um, and what their responses were to different things. Um, so I gave you three options of what might have been things that came out from that. So this was a bit more of an um, exploratory question. Um, and, you know, you might think um, that people think something else about climate change, but I sort of just picked out one thing that I thought um, was uh, interesting from the other questions. So this is me sort of um, projecting my sort of, um, my sort of finding onto this question. But so the whole... Um, process was just to find out, was just to explore the data. So I think most of you have answered that question now. And um, yeah, you've kind of selected the, the point that I highlighted it, which I thought that it was quite interesting that, that um, many people uh, did actually think that um, planes contributed. I think I've put in a slide here. Um, um, about half the people interviewed thought that planes did contribute to climate change. So there was an awareness and acknowledgement that flying was not great for climate change. But then when you looked at the percentage of people that were willing to change their behaviours, um, you know, there was a strong sort of negative skew going on. You know, most people were saying that they disagreed. Um, I mean, there's a significant portion there, 22%, that say they never fly, so that's not too bad. But compared to the other categories there, like, um, you know, when we looked at where people prepared to stop driving more, more people were saying agree to that. When we're flying, there seemed to be quite a strong resistance to, um, to giving that up. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then there was just one final question. So linking back to the catalogue um, and having a look at the catalogue page for um, the British Social Attitude Survey and looking at what was the main collection method. Um, was it a web survey, was it a face-to-face -face survey, or was it a phone interview? And so when you go to the catalogue page, if you scroll down to the bottom half of the page, you find the methodology. And um, and the methodology, you will see this. And as most of you have said, um, you can see that it was a face-to-face -face interview. Um, and just as an aside here, I guess, this is kind of further sort of evidence of how um, significant these surveys are. Most of these key surveys that we hold um, are conducted face-to-face -face in people's homes. 
So there's a whole um, a whole group of people out there whose professional occupation is survey interviewers, and they go into people's homes, and these interviews can take generally about an hour, maybe more, and they go into people's homes repeatedly, and for the longitudinal surveys, they go you know, every two years to the same people. Other people are contacted randomly, and they just, you know, they might get a letter first, and then, you know, they get a knock on the door asking to be interviewed, and there's these interviewers that um, give them these quality face-to-face -face interviews. Um, for a substantial period of time, so it's it's all the data is collected in a very um, sort of robust way. Obviously, a lot of these surveys have been put on hold at the moment, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the data um, in the coming sort of year or two. Lots of these surveys have moved to web-based or to phone-based, um, so it's changing, and that change in data collection will have some impact on the answers. Um, so that's an interesting sort of just aside to consider.